Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. I have one of my all-time favorite guests. He comes um, almost every six months. We have Dr. Mark Laponis, and he is talking about his book, Ultra Longevity, which is something that is a big concern of mine lately, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this. So welcome, Mark. Great. Thanks, CJ. Great to be here again. So uh, as I've been... I'm. As I've been approaching my 50s, I think I'm maybe too late in this game because <laughs> as I read in your book, you start aging at 30 and then your 30s or 40s and when your body starts aging. Is that right? Hey, it's better than the alternative, as they say. Yeah. I thought, when I, I, I was always wondering, when is the date, like when should you start worrying? You know, because there's almost like a, I hate to say this, a drop dead date where you think, okay, I, I can stretch on this unhealthy lifestyle until this point. Is there is there such a thing? No, it's all relative, you know, and that is health's a very relative, you know, issue. And that is, I know people at 75 that could probably, you know, run me into the ground. They're, you know, healthier than me. And it's not because, you know, they haven't aged appreciably, but they've stayed healthy. They've stayed fit, you know, so it's all relative, you know, and that is we can all do better ourselves than we're doing right now. I could be fitter and, you know, I could be, you know, better shape. I could be more muscular, you know, all these right. things that we keep on working on. Yeah. So it's just kind of an endless there's process. No cliff, there's no cliff that you fall off. No. There's no. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's too late. Screw it. I'm just going to eat Doritos Let's on my couch. Keep up with things. <laughs> okay. So you have, um, you know, the Canyon Ranch is a very, the place where your medical director is a very special place where people are able to go in and do a health analysis. And so do they usually come to you just as a general, like, hey, I just want to know what's going on? Or usually they come to you when some health crisis hits? It's a grab bag. I mean, we might have people with serious problems that need some solutions, and maybe they've gotten the standard treatment they want to do better. Right. So that's one, that's one situation. Another one is they just want to get a checkup, make sure everything's okay. Another one might be that they have some type, type of symptom that's plaguing them that they've got no resolution on, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. looking for other approaches to address it. So those are usually the, the types of people that we see. Okay. So <laughs> I... I know this is a crazy question, and I know you'll probably say it depends, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So when you see someone, you know, in their 50s, and their 60s, 70s, 80s, because I assume you're seeing people through the gamut of all different age ranges, sure. what's kind of a profile of a typical 50, 60, like what, what should we expect decade by decade when we, as we age? Well, I think, you know, 50s and 60s is, is still, you know, it's a lot about stress. I mean, that's a big thing there because... So many people, whether you're 30, 40, or 50, stress is the major factor there. Mm -hmm. And that's because, look, you're trying to, you know, make a living and take care of your family and, and do all the things you need to do to stay healthy and, you know, deal with this crazy world that we're in. And that's stressful. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not breathing. When you're saying that, I realize I'm not even breathing when you're saying that. Okay. All right. Tell me what happens after 50s and 60s. Well, you know, it's true. I think after that, maybe... There's a little acceptance that you know you can't, you've done what you can, and you can't change everything, and maybe the stress is a little bit less when you're in your 70s. I think perhaps, yeah. You know, but of course, then the stress becomes health issues because mm -hmm. then your knee is hurting, and you're wondering if you know you can get your blood pressure under control, and you know all the health health issues that occur in our 70s. So the best strategy is still to take care of yourself when you're 20, 30, and 40, so that you don't. <laughs> have to have problems when yeah. you're 60 and 70. And so, I mean, do you really feel that, because you've been visiting and seeing these people for a while, it, when they do go when they do go in, when they're 50, 50s, is it echoing for you? It's echoing for me. Okay, good. Um, I'm hearing myself. Maybe it's due to my old age, <laughs> but I'm hearing myself echoing. Okay, so when you see someone, let's say they come in at 40 or 50, and you and you track them, I assume that they come in and, and kind of, hey, hey, doc, give me a checkup right now. Do you see when they follow things like, you know, your, your seven-step program, do you see an appreciable difference in their real age or their aging? I mean, I yes. I mean, I believe in prevention. The trouble is this, and that is it's hard to prove prevention because well, how do you know what you prevented? You know, you right. prevent cancer here, a heart attack. How do you really know? Right. So it's hard to prove it, but my sense is, is that there's a payout. In other words, when people do take care of themselves and they invest in their health, that there's a return on that investment. And then that is they do better. You know, the people that, for example, um, don't take care of themselves, they don't exercise, they, they don't eat right, they take substances, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, 
they shorten their lives and yeah, they have yeah. health complications. I, I think, you know, there's always the, the rare person like the, the George Burns, you know, that lives to be a hundred smoking cigars and everybody points at George and says, see, you don't need to live a healthy life. But you, look at George is a rare bird, you know, right. he's a very rare bird. And we can't expect those results because as they say, your mileage may vary. Well, so I don't want to be George Burns. That's not my... <laughs> 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 an anemic sick scarcity minded individual like i don't want to go there either <laughs> no that shouldn't be our goal but in terms of longevity so, yeah yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I actually, my, my role model is maybe my mom and my mom, right? My dad actually died at 67, 68 because he yeah. was a smoker. He never stopped smoking. He died of a heart attack. My mom um, works out all the time. She's very active and she practices a lot of the different things, not because she read your book, but she just practices these things naturally. My father-in-law is 82. He has his own company. It's still thriving and growing and he's popping out new products and my uh, mother-in-law similar kind like they're just they're thriving but I don't know if they're typical I don't know if I just have good genes um, or you know because I have a mixed genes right I have my dad who died of a heart attack at 67 and I have my mom who's walking from walking around downtown Seattle for literally miles a day back and forth from downtown up and down hills you know try to be like your mom (laughs) okay but um is she typical? Like if I, if I were to survey a bunch of 70 to 80 year olds, it seems like when I read books, like I read your book, I read um, a couple other do- books from doctors. Most of doc, most people are popping meds. Like they're like six, 15 pills a day. They can't, she says that some people in her <clears throat> home or they can barely walk. I mean, what's typical or is there one? There's look, there's no guarantees that get us to be 80 in good shape, but if there was any theme that's a recurring theme, let's say, that is the best, you know, way to increase your odds of making it, I'd say be careful about eating. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the overeating that shortens so many lives. And smoking, I'd say between those two, if we could get rid of overeating and smoking, uh, we probably have gotten rid of most of the causes of premature death. Yeah. So, you know, the people that do the, re- the best and live the longest, you know, pretty clearly, they don't overeat. Right. And they don't smoke. And they don't smoke. Those two things, I think, are the. You know, besides that, there's no rules that apply to everybody, perhaps. Yeah. So in your book, um, the Seven Step uh, Ultra Longevity Program, you have breathing, eating, which I'm now hearing is like probably one of the top things that you can do. Yeah, uh, so. Sleeping, dance, love, soothe, and enhance. And I think actually love is actually a critical piece too. Not because I'm like all peace, love, and understanding, but because love relates to your stress. Yeah. I agree. I and, you know, humans are social beings. We require love. It's not just something that we would like. It's something that we need. Yeah. Because um, people in isolation perish. So that's very important. I'm not, I don't know if it's the most important, but I don't think we can live a good life without it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a ton of questions <clears throat> about, well, first I want to, the whole premise of this book is, it is, hey, it's our immunity system. The reason why we age, let me see if I can summarize it, and I'm probably going to summarize it somewhat incorrectly, so please correct me (laughs) before I make errors. But from what I understand about your book is, hey, we age because um, we have, it's our organs that are actually contract diseases, and our organs that contract diseases because of um, being, having an overstimulated immune system. Is that right? Help me. Yeah, let me let me let me put it in a different framework for you, and that is, uh, you know, our bodies. You know, we've been we think humans on Earth for about two hundred thousand years, and the story of human survival for that time period has really been about two things. It's been about being able to recover from infections mm-hmm. and to be able to heal from injuries. And if you could overcome an infection, you know, you stepped on a, you know, something dirty and you got an infection in your foot. And if that didn't travel into your bloodstream and kill you, you had a strong immune system, you could survive. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you broke your leg, you had to be able to heal that and survive. And so our immune system developed to be able to handle those two things. And it really does those well. In fact, Mm -hmm. that's what inflammation is all about. It's all about helping us to recover from an infection or to heal from an injury. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, is that same system that was designed to help us to survive doesn't function that well when there's no infection and there's no injury. Now that Mm -hmm. system might cause damage in our body through what we would consider an autoimmune mechanism, a process where the immune system is actually attacking and damaging our organs 
by trying to do what it normally would do, and that is fight infections and heal injury. Unfortunately, you know, we probably weren't designed to be living 110 years old. We have to be able to control that autoimmune process that occurs later in life, uh, which was really born in this idea of, of protecting us, you know, being right. good. So, or I need to injure and infect myself. That's another that approach. Day, you know, I mean, that's something what the immune system is designed to do. And right. as long as it's able to do that, it's working well. But, you know, it's when it sort of, you know, doesn't have infections or injuries, then it can attack us. And that that is what tends to get Americans, because Americans are dying more from autoimmune diseases than from infectious diseases today. And that's changed in the last 80 years because of, you know, medical uh, advances. Right. You mean like vaccinations, immunizations, all these things? techniques, hygiene, uh, you know, sure, immunizations, medications, you know, pills for cholesterol, for infections, antibiotics, all those have really done a great job of extending life expectancy. Right. Uh, the trouble is, is it doesn't really affect the autoimmune problems that occur later in life. Like, for example, you know, the two top killers in Americans over age 45 um, would be heart disease and cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, cancer sort of leads, you know, earlier, and then when you head to about 65, heart disease takes over. But they're neck and neck for the last three decades of our, of our lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And what happens is with heart disease, what's causing a heart attack is actually an autoimmune reaction. It's when the white blood cells are attacking the plaque in the heart, making it rupture and then damage the lining of the heart artery that makes a clot form. But the process was triggered by this autoimmune attack. It's as though the white blood cells were attacking this uh, plaque like it were an infection. Yeah. Sort of you know, trying to deal with it like it was an infection and that makes the plaque unstable. And then the plaque can rupture. And we know now that it's the autoimmune attack of the plaque in the heart that's triggering all these heart attacks. Wow. And, interesting. and with cancer, uh, the white blood cells, unfortunately, try to attack cancer the same way that it attacks an infection. And that is, uh, it tries to attack the cancer as if, it were, as if it was an infection. And that means, you know, more white blood cells and bring in more blood flow. And that's not so good if you've got cancer. That feeds the cancer. And so the white blood cells think that they're going to help, but they don't have the right tools. They don't have the right weapons. And they actually, you know, unfortunately feed the cancer by bringing in blood flow. And that's uh, you know, not desirable. Okay. So typically how I think about it is, oh, I have, you know, you, you wait until you get cancer or heart issue and then you go and try to go get a, a slew of different medicines to prevent it from happening or maybe you have like high blood pressure and you start taking statin or, or, or whatever but the premise of your book is try to prevent that from happening by addressing the root cause which is the overactive immune system it could be or another way to think about it is you know the medicines that people are taking nowadays for both heart disease and cancer they're in the category of what we would call immunosuppressive medicines. They're suppressing the immune system. So things like your statins, your Crestor, Lipitor, Mevacor, Pravacol, Zocor are immunosuppressive. The chemo that is given during cancer treatment, immunosuppressive. And that's an important effect because if you're suppressing the white blood cells, they're not fighting the cancer or the plaque as though or an infection. And then you're helping to you know prevent those complications of those conditions. And so the treatment is actually the right treatment. It's, it's geared to reduce the immune system's responsiveness. And that is desirable, believe it or not. Okay, so one of the ways that um, you mentioned is the CRP test is one way that you actually can gauge. Like, So the question then becomes, how healthy is my immune system and how should I address it? And you talk about a CRP test. I literally just had a physical exam and I went through all the different websites to all the different tests I should take and a CRP test wasn't on it. What What is that test and um, how does it work? Yeah, well, that, that test now is a great test. It's been around for about 15 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Before that, we could measure the CRP, which stands for C-reactive protein, but it wasn't that accurate. 15 years ago, the test got very accurate. And then what we learned was, is that the levels of inflammation that are causing these problems, these conditions later in life, are levels that are very low. We can't feel them. In other words, it's not giving us a pain. It's not making us feel tired. We can't feel the blood flow. We don't feel the inflammation. You have to measure it. It's mm. so low that it doesn't give us a pain. It doesn't give us a fever. And so the way to measure it now is with the measurement of this C-reactive protein. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And all it is, it's a protein that the white blood cells, the little Pac-Man in our bloodstream that are gobbling up these germs use to communicate. They're talking using these chemicals. And so when we measure the level of C-reactive protein, it's sort of like eavesdropping on the conversation that the white blood cells are having. You know, mm -hmm. they're chattering back and forth, sending these chemical messages. And we're sort of eavesdropping on that conversation. And what we're hearing is one white blood cell is telling the other white blood cell, Houston, we have a problem. You know, there's something going on. You need to come help out. <clears throat> and that could be, you know, a plaque. It could be cancer or it could be an infection or injury. The problem is, is our white blood cells really only have one way to respond. And that's a good way to respond when you've got an infection or injury. It's not the best way to respond for heart disease. Uh, okay. So if you were to get a CRP test, don't take it if you're actually having medical issues at the time sure, because it's going to be it, high regardless. It'll be high. Like if you've got pneumonia, bronchitis, a kidney infection. Yeah it will be high. No, the time to check your CRP level is when you go in for your annual checkup. Right. Your routine physical. That's the time to get your CRP blood test. Right. And so when you actually have this high CRP, it means that there's lots of chatter. I mean, those white sure. blood cells are like, have a problem. You know, yeah. the there's cells, a problem. There's a problem. And they're, yeah. Like, Come on down. Help out. Can you bring some friends? Right. You know, <laughs> Right, so that and that's when actually that's almost a almost a signal to say, gosh, you have you know you need to actually get your immunity system so it's kind of calm down, relax. That's, I mean, so when someone goes into your office, they get a high CRP test, yeah. and you say, what? Oh gosh, do you what? Have to figure out why. You have to understand why. Yeah. So that's the whole purpose of the book, and that is to help people to understand what should they be considering if their CRP level is running high. Right. And so, for example, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is if there's some breathing problem, you know, does somebody have a problem with their breathing, like asthma, or maybe they have emphysema, or they might have a breathing problem called sleep apnea. All of those raise the C-reactive protein because, mm -hmm. you know, they trigger inflammation. And, you know, here's a way to think about inflammation. You could think about it, CJ, as a stress response of the immune system. So anything that upsets our immune system will trigger inflammation. Uh, the most common ones, of course, infection and injury, but there's other things that will do it too. Uh, emotional stress can do it. You know, if we're lonely, if we're sad, if we're angry, if we're upset, that's enough to trigger a response in the immune system. Mm -hmm. Our immune system gets upset even with a bad mood. Mm. How does that work? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know that if someone's ha uh, having anxiety, or let's say it's hostility, anger, or depression, all three of those have been linked with more inflammation and more autoimmune disease as a result. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know what the solution is, but I usually tell people to go for your solution, the love there. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's stress. If you're fear-oriented. That's, well, yeah, that's love is the antidote for fear and despair, you know, yeah. and if you feel the love, then you can't be angry at the same time. Right. You can't. So that that's why I think that the number two, when I read your book, it seems like, wow, it seems like, okay, infection and um, injury, we somewhat have more control over than we did before. The rampant attitudes towards fear, <laughs> I don't think anyone has, including myself, has complete control over it. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by that kind of attitude and sure. mentality day in, day out. But I want to go back to sleep because one of the things, um, so of your seven-step program, that's one of them, the sleep. Yeah. And yeah. what I found interesting, it's not the quantity of sleep, it's actually the quantity quality of sleep, which I thought was interesting, because I always think, you know, eight hours, nine hours, that's a, you know, seven to eight, to eight, eight and a half, that's the sweet spot, but that's not necessarily so. Tell us more about that. One of the things I love to do here at Canyon Ranch is we have some guests that take a sleep test, mm -hmm. and that is they'll be sleeping in their room, but they'll be on a monitor, and we can tell how their breathing is while they sleep, and how many dreams that they've had, and how much deep sleep they get, and how much light sleep there was, and how the quality of their sleep is overall. And you know what? It's fascinating because what I've learned is there's a lot of variation in how good someone can sleep, how well someone can sleep. And that is, some people are just good sleepers, others are not. And there's a lot of variability. I've seen people that in five hours can get all the sleep they need for a night. Other people in nine hours in bed barely got a nap because they never got into deep sleep. Mm. And, you know, I don't know the reason for that. I think some of it is, is 
genes. I think some of it is stage of life. You know, as we get older, we don't sleep as well. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think some of it is, is your family because if you've got young kids, you're always half awake trying to listen for them. You yeah. know, There's a lot of factors that might affect the quality of the sleep that we get. Yeah, and you mentioned too in the book, I mean, caffeine, if you're actually, caffeine yeah, and sleeping pills, like if you're taking those things, yeah. those affect the quality of your sleep. A glass of wine, you know, I see it a lot where people are having a glass or two at night and they can't figure out why they wake up every morning at three o'clock. You know, and the answer is, well, that's when the wine's wearing off and, you you know, your body's telling you to go get another glass. Mm. Of course, that's not the answer. Yeah. The answer is don't have the second glass to start with. Yeah, don't have the first glass to start with oh, so sure. that you don't even need to have the second glass because you're bought. Yeah, that's not a good sleeping. Definitely interrupts sleep. You know, that's going to impair sleep. Yeah, yeah. All right, so in terms of super easy things that you can do for your immune system, one is breathe, which I've been actually focusing. One of the things that you mentioned is breathing, and there's this three-part breath where there's a belly breathing, which if you look at a newborn baby, you can see you know their bellies go up and down, up and down. And then basically look at any adult that's how we usually breathe up in our chest or you know this kind of diaphragm area versus yeah. our whole thing and that seems like a simple thing you can do right if you it seems simple but you know to retrain yourself to breathe i mean it's not easy it'd be like someone telling you look you know i want you to sleep on your side instead of on your back I... well, how do you train yourself to do that you're asleep and you know breathing is like that it's automatic we don't think about it or posture you right. know, you tell, sit. the only way you're going to sit up straight is yes. if you're thinking about it right and the same is true with breathing, and that is it's a conscious process. In fact, it's the only automatic process of our body that we get to control. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't really control your body temperature and your stomach acidity and your digestive rate and how fast your bowels are going, but you can really control your breathing. So that one we have control over, and it's worth learning a few of these breathing techniques, I think, to help calm stress and, right. and relax the body. And I think you know how to do that, softening the belly and, and taking more time breathing out so that you make sure you exhale fully before the next breath and slowing the overall rate of breathing down so that we're not breathing 20 times a minute. Maybe it's, you know, six or eight times a minute. Right. And, and that actually has so many benefits overall. I mean, aside from your immune system, it kind of just calms you down so that you can relate better to the world around you. You're more present. To me, that's that's like, you know, a three for one. You know, you, you breathe and you breathe more deeply. You calm down your immune system. You also calm down your central nervous system. You're just more present in the day. Um, well, you but, probably know, but breathing is a big uh, focus with meditation. When yeah. people are meditating to try to calm and focus the mind, they're often told to focus on the breathing. Right. Uh, the breath in and the breath out. And so there, this focus on the breathing is, it's a meditation technique. And so, yeah, it has other benefits, sure, besides helping to calm the immune system. There's other, there's other right. benefits of the breathing techniques, too, yeah. sure. All right, so the other one is eating, which you're saying is, of the seven, probably one of the most impactful things. Like, if, if we did one thing, it's the eating piece. Well, sure, because we got to eat, and we eat you know, a few times a day, usually, and that always affects how our immune system is working. And you know, in terms of the rules of eating, I'd say there's a few simple rules. The first one is you know, try to eat less. You know, overeating triggers an inflammatory reaction, a response that's a stress response of the immune system. We don't know why. It might be the oxidative stress that the meal gives us. In other words, the calories converted into free radicals. Mm -hmm. It could be because the more food we eat, the more surveillance the immune system has to do to check for things that we might have ingested, bacteria, parasites, this type of thing. And so we know that overeating triggers an inflammatory reaction. And so one way to solve that is, you know, try to eat less. Mm -hmm. And that is both in the long run and in the short run. So, you know, saying that, you know, oh, it's, you know, Sunday and, you know, we've done, we've been good all week. We can pig out on Sunday. Uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> shouldn't expose yourself to that. You better <laughs> say, eh, no, I'll have a bite, you know, and save it for, you know, some other time because just that one meal can trigger an inflammatory reaction. And so I try to encourage people to try to, you know, reduce the size of the meals or spread them out a little bit more. Wait, just that one meal. Wait, let's go back because I'm in yeah. the splurge category. So... <laughs> A binge eater. Yeah, I'm a binge eater. It's like, I've been good all week. Let's have yeah. pizza now. So that, sure. that splurge of pizza, right, where it's, yeah. you know, I'm consuming well, way I'm more calories. I'm not slice of pizza. I'm thinking about Thanksgiving dinner, CJ. Okay, you know, got it. Having three servings and, and pot, all right? So okay, okay. That's a meal you got to be careful about because that can cause a problem. 
Okay, so it's like when you when you actually have these gigantic pig outs, and what happens is your system. It, you talk about these spurts. Is that what you mean by a spurt? Sure, it's a burst. It's a burst of of inflammation, and it lasts for three or four hours after a meal like that. You know, in the old days when I used to work in the emergency room, a lot of times we'd have somebody come in and they say, you know, I got indigestion because uh, you know I ate too much. Well, that was the heart attack, not the indigestion. It was the you know, overeating that triggered the heart attack because wow. of the inflammation that came with the meal. Wow. Okay. So, so eating less is one thing. So it's yeah. So that's one thing. The next one is to try to include more fish in your diet. Uh, we think that people should be eating fish around between two and five times a week. Wow. Uh, if people are eating fish twice a week, they reduce their chance of heart attack, stroke, and death by 50 percent less than once a week and so that's an easy thing I mean I think you know you could get salmon you could have some chunk light tuna salad you could have uh, you know trout or tilapia you could get maybe uh, like a Dover sole a sea bass all of those would be really good choices for fish or maybe you go for sushi but you know try not to get the tuna sushi because it's a little contaminated so you'd want to get let's say the mackerel sushi or the mm -hmm. eel or you'd want to get um, the salmon right, um, all the small fish, fish because the bigger the fish yes, the more yes. yeah the more they're filled with sure all sorts of toxins on the food chain yeah yeah we think you know you're supposed to be getting that fish uh, between two and five times a week and if you do you can cut your chance of heart attack stroke in half that's shocking yeah, that's so that, really it, shocking. That's that's really quite manageable, I think, and yeah. and most people should be able to reach those goals. You know, and some people tell me they just don't like fish, and and then we try to find a fish that they like, or, you know, if they can't eat fish and just can't, you know, they can't eat it because they don't like it, that's where maybe a fish oil supplement might come into some value. Right. Um, of course, that's on case by case, individual basis, but. I think that's something that people are probably over supplementing on is fish oil mm -hmm. because a fish oil supplement it's it's you know first of all it's not an antidote for a t-bone or a pepperoni you know pizza I mean <laughs> it's just not that strong, you know? and you know second you know when people say you know I take a fish oil the next question I always have them is do you eat fish and they say yeah I eat fish all the time and you know then the answer is well why take a supplement when you're getting plenty in your diet we just don't know we we need you around to help we just don't know. <laughs> All right. So in terms of um, in terms of the quantity, I just want to share a tip that we did in a previous um, video because I was shocked because I, I was thinking, okay, I'll just decrease my quantity. But what what I started doing, and it sounds crazy, and it takes effort, is yep. so if I have a bowl of oatmeal, I'll eat you know half of it or a quarter of it, depending yep. until yep. I'm full, and then I yep. stop, and yep. then I it just I mean it's. I don't know. It sits around for like an hour or two, and then I get hungry again, and I eat another quarter, and it sits around, and then I eat another quarter, and then I eat another quarter. Yeah, and so yeah. this bowl of oatmeal, which I used to consume in 20 minutes, is, you know, maybe five-minute increments over like three hours. But that's because yeah. I... I because you had said like take an energy bar and divide it into four, but yeah. that's what you mean by the quantity of food. Because I think at the first when I heard it, or when I'm reading it, Mike, okay, I'll just decrease the quantity. But you're still hungry. If I eat, just eat a small amount, I'm still hungry. So just take the original thing you're going to eat it and divide it into smaller things. You know what I heard and what I really loved, CJ, is you know you, I heard that you were listening to your appetite. You know, and that's so important because you were eating until you were full, and then you were stopping, and then you were waiting until you were hungry again, and then you were eating. And you know, there's this terrible epidemic in our country right now where people are eating when they're not hungry yeah and that is because they're supposed to have a meal you know they're getting up oh it's breakfast time I better have breakfast but they realize I'm not even hungry why am I eating breakfast well you know there's a simple rule of thumb if you're not hungry don't eat right well it's here's the th but here's the thing that that defies that because in, in your book you talk about um, people like myself who eat who have you know I don't eat breakfast I'm kind of like you know I'll eat at 11 maybe something and then I'll eat at 3 and then I'll eat a dinner a gigantic dinner at 7 because I haven't consumed enough calories during the day and then it starts a cycle of I'm not hungry during breakfast because I consumed all of and my calories and then you shouldn't eat it but you see that's the point and that is if you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry for breakfast, but you eat it, you'll overconsume that day. But I thought in your book you're suggesting eating it so you can reset the cycle so that you get back into consuming little bits each time. You know, honestly, it does not matter. In other words, whether you're eating, let's say you're eating 1,500 calories a day or 1,700. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can eat them all day long. 
You can eat them in one meal right before bed. You can eat them, um, for example, in the morning and have nothing the rest of the day. You could fast for the weekend and have add those 1,700 calories into your weekly calorie con consumption. And you know what people don't realize is your body's in control. And that is, it's telling you how much to eat through your appetite. And so when you say, I didn't eat in the morning and now I get so hungry, I eat everything at night, that's your body in control. It's not that you've, the wheels have come off and you've lost control and you don't know what to do and you're overeating. No, your appetite is telling you to do that. I know, but then I overconsume. Then no, I'm eating well, calories after 4 o'clock, which I thought was matter, a no-no. It doesn't matter when you eat the calories. It doesn't? Okay. No. I thought it's harder for your body to digest when you're sleeping. No, no, you can eat the calories anytime you like. And uh, the thing is, is we want to try to eat less. And if our body's in control telling us to eat so much, how do we override the control and eat less? See, that's the trick. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. hard. And that's why weight loss is such a difficult thing for people. It's hard for them to lose weight because your appetite is in control. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. say, you know, just exercise more. Well, guess what? When you exercise more, that increases your appetite. And <laughs> it didn't help. Right. No, I know. Actually, after I work out, I'm, I'm so ravenous. Hungry. So hungry, sure. Yeah. You should well, you know what? I, I interviewed this one woman. I, I, have you heard of emotional freedom tapping before? Yes. Okay. So emotional, emotional, emotional freedom tapping is tapping all these, for people who don't know, or tapping all these acupressure points in your face. And it calms your system down. And so I was talking to someone. I have an interview on the website about someone who uses tapping before eating because oftentimes when we're eating we're what you you even described this in your book you were doing emotional eating we are eating to because we're unhappy about something and it's not, what it's not hunger yeah it's not hunger it's that we're trying it's to stress. fill yeah fill an it's emotional anxiety. need yeah worry it's yeah i get it and so what she suggests is that before you actually eat you yeah. tap so if you have so if you have any unexpressed emotions that you're you're trying to get out on the plate, you get it out. <laughs> you get it out on your tapping beforehand, and I start, tried doing that and it really helped. And then she said, um, divide your meal in, in a third or quarter. So yep. tap in the beginning, and then and then divide what you're going to eat in half, and then eat that half or a quarter or whatever, and then tap and then tune in and say, Am I hungry? And if after you tap when you really tune into you're like actually I'm not hungry I just emotionally I want to eat that because it's going to feel emotionally good but I'm not hungry sure but I that was my I best tip that. ever I like it you know another thing that people can do if you're trying to sort out whether it's an emotion like stress worry anxiety etc or actual hunger a good way to do it is get a little exercise like you can just run up the stairs twice that blows off steam and it relieves the stress, but it doesn't relieve hunger. So if it's really hungry, you'll still be hungry. Mm. Um, if it's worry, if it's stress, if it's frustration, a little bit of exercise usually makes you feel better. Oh, interesting. Then you, interesting. Have, then you don't have to eat. I guess it sort of works like that. Yeah, so you're relieving you're relieving the stress valve so that you don't necessarily eat your worry sure. so or doubt or fear exercise, or whatever. It could work the same way. Yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> so you can burn some calories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then, all right, so there is actually something that you said in the book that I wanted to ask you about because I thought was so intriguing. You said, like our body temperature and our metabolism rate, our appetite has its own thermostat. This is what related to what we're talking about, that, yeah. that tells us when to eat. The appetite thermostat is set, it set to shut off when we have eaten enough calories to maintain our current weight. So if the bulk of calories have been eaten by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you'll have smaller appetite at dinner or, or later. Um so that's yeah, what, like that? yeah. Is that's that brilliant? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> okay, so that I still believe it. Yeah, so I think so. So when I read that, I thought, wow, interesting. So that's the thing that you were just mentioning. It's that basically we're, but then our body. So it's, for example, how we figure out the amount of calories our body wants. So I'm 137 right now. So if you take 137 times 11, is what you said? Is it times 11 or something? That's the amount of calories. If I wanted to look, look, calories matter, but they don't count. In other words, you can't count up calories. I mean, if you're off by 10, you'll gain 10 pounds. You know, so, you know, I don't, I don't really like the idea of counting calories because it's really impossible. Nobody, you can't look at food and, you know, guess, even if with weighing and measuring, it's still too vague, to tell you the truth. 
Now your appetite, that's a good way to know how much you're getting. Ah, uh, I see. Oh, no, no. I'm just saying like how many calories you're supposed to be consuming. But so like hypothetically. I, I, yes. I mean, it depends. It sort of depends on how active you are and your age and, you know, uh, whether you exercise or not and what your metabolism is. Okay. So let's say, let's say, cause you did a calculation for me before and you said about CJ about 16, 1300 to 1600 calories based on my age and everything before. You'd be losing weight on that. I'm okay. Guessing. But like, let's say it's, Let's say hypothetically it's 1,600 calories. So based on this passage that you've written, (laughs) uh, it says that our appetite is is, it's set to shut off when we've eaten enough calories. So if I eat basically a a Cinnabon Cinnabon roll, roll, right, which is probably 1,600 calories in one sitting, if I ate that during breakfast, my first meal, what does it mean that my thermostat is shut off because I, I can eat more <laughs> they're like come lunch this dinner I'm going to still want to eat more even though I consume my 1600 calories in that setting so I didn't understand exactly what this passage meant even though it was brilliant <laughs> think, think about it more in the long run in other words here's what happens in the long run like I'll give you another example okay. um, in October my wife and I went to on a hiking trip in mm-hmm. Bhutan you know it's in the Himalayas it's mm-hmm. over between India and Nepal and uh, we were in a tent for 12 days and hiking like over 100 miles at 16, wow. 17,000 feet. I mean, it was the most strenuous thing I've ever done. And we lost weight. Uh, I probably lost about 15 pounds. Wow. And, you know, my, I had to just tighten the belt up. And that's because you're hiking eight hours a day and you can't eat enough to, you know, keep up with those demands. And so uh, when I got home, uh, within four days, I had put all the 15 pounds back on. Wow. And that's because I was so hungry, I couldn't stop eating. I literally, I mean, my appetite was like this. And normally people don't notice changes in their appetite, but I did there because it was such a difference being in Bhutan and coming home. And I just, I put those 15 pounds back on like that uh, through two ways. One, my body slowed its metabolism and increased my appetite to get me back to where I was, the 15 pounds that I had lost. Mm. So those, those little, you know, changes, adaptations that our body makes are, automatic and subtle and we don't always feel them and so for you if you had that cinnabon but you still wanted to eat more and you ate more later that day you might not notice it but the two days after that you'd eat less and that's because your appetite was less because you had had an excess of calories and that made your metabolism speed up and your appetite go down and that weight would come off now the way that you can break that system is by continually overeating, in other words, eating more than your appetite tells you to eat week after week after week. And if you do that for weeks on end, you'll become overweight. Uh, okay. So this goes back to the thing that we had talked about in the previous interview about your set point. That That's someone right. has set a set point. So you actually have a set point of a certain weight before you yes. went to Bhutan. You yes. went and you lost 15 pounds yeah. and your body's like, no, no, no. I remembered where I was. Went right, right back up 15 pounds. Because, so. because why? Because it said, no, no, this is this is what you should be, Mark. You have to be this way, and I'm going to create a system so that you'll – I'm going to create hunger. I'm going to influence your appetite and your metabolism to keep you at that weight. And here's what's strange, CJ. You know, if you're skinny, you know, there's some scrawny, skinny people that um, want to gain weight, and they force feed themselves, and they eat pizza, and they eat ice cream, and they finally put on 20 pounds, and they say, thank goodness, I put on the weight. And then uh, a month later, the weight has come off. They didn't change a thing. Their body loses the weight and puts them back to their set point. So it's just as hard for skinny people to gain weight as it is for old people. Oh, I feel so sorry for them. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So if I wanted to change my set point, how does one? How long does it take to change one set point? And how long until you can it takes say? Takes a long time. How long? It takes a long time. You know, I don't know exactly, but I think it's on the range of a year. In other words, if you change your weight and keep it at that new weight for a year, you'll get a new set point. Boy, that's a long time. So if you wanted to be that 15 pounds lighter, yeah. you would have had to, you know, stave Star- off. Yes. Starve myself and kept it off for up to a year. Oh, before gosh. Up. Yeah. Okay. That just... So hard. Right? <laughs> oh, oh, look, you're not the only one. You, know, you think you're the only one crying? <laughs> How many Americans are crying right now? Get in line. Stop crying. (laughs) Okay, I want to answer some of the questions. We have a bunch of um, questions that people are asking. So um, the one question was, uh, how do you, okay, the one question I think we answered is how do you change, so how do you change your set point then so that you have to keep it for a year? Yeah. You keep it off 
for a year. Now, there's lots of ways to take the weight off, you know, lots of different strategies and, you know, different strategies work differently in different people. You know, some people want to write down everything they eat. Some people want to cut everything in half. Some people want to cut out carbs. Some want to cut out fat. Some want to go gluten free. Someone kind of got to cut out dairy. Some want to cut out booze, ice. I mean, there's a lot of things to do to get there. But unless you keep it off for a long period of time, it's going to come back. Oh, that's just it's depressing. I know. It's why so many Americans have trouble. Yeah, I think we should just live in Bhutan for a year. <laughs> that would do it. <laughs> That's one solution. Okay, so here are some of the other questions. Um, didn't people live a lot longer in the old days? No, they did not. Uh, we are enjoying right now the longest life expectancy ever on the planet. Right now in the U.S., a boy or girl, let's see, a girl born today can expect over 81 years of life. A, a, a boy born today can expect about 76. So that's the longest life expectancy we've ever enjoyed. In fact, back in the 1920s, the average life expectancy in the U.S. was less than 50 years old. Uh, not because people weren't living into their 70s. Less than 50 years old? Wait a second. I'm 50. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that's because, look, we had such a high rate of infant mortality and, and maternal mortality. When the babies and their mothers, young mothers died, that lowers the average life expectancy a lot. That all changed with, with vaccines and good hygiene and surgical techniques and antibiotics. That's what really led to the longer life expectancy because we overcame the infectious diseases. And, and so we we're living longer now. Wow. Okay, so 50 is the new 80. I mean, 80 is the new 50. Uh, yeah, in some ways it is, because we're living longer now than we ever have at any time in, in human history. Mm, okay, so the other question was, what about GMOs and hormones that are put into our foods now? So we were talking about various toxins and all these other things, and how do we, so that question was about with GMOs and hormones. Well, I agree. I mean, it's better to eat cleaner food and, and uh, you know, whether it's been radiated or have hormones or have uh, antibiotics or other medicines that they now give to the animals that we might be consuming or even the water that has chemicals and medicines in it. Because when people get rid of their old pills, they throw it down the toilet and some of it ends up in the water supply. And so, you know, we've wow. got a real issue with the, you know, the cleanliness of the food supply. And I agree that, you know, it's best to eat a cleaner diet, cleaner food. Um, you know, this GMO is tricky because um, it's hard to know, you know, when a GMO has crossed the line. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we've been hybridizing uh, plants for centuries and we know how to get, I mean, if you look at a tomato today, it looks nothing like the tomatoes from 300 years ago. And if you look at a piece of corn, I mean, the corn that the Indians have with these scraggly little things like this, now we have these huge big ears of corn and that's right. because we've hybridized it and we've genetically modified these plants to produce higher yields and better crops, taste better, you know, we like it better, etc. So that is genetic modification. It's just done more slowly through hybridization. Now, you know, where you draw the line between that kind of, you know, genetic manipulation and one that might be dangerous to humans, like putting in a pesticide into right. an herbicide. Uh, resistance into a plant. Um, you know, I don't know, and that is we have to look at these GMOs, each one on an individual basis to see which one's dangerous. You know, I wouldn't want an herbicide resistance uh, resistance gene in my plant if I could help it, because that means the plant's been sprayed with Roundup and I'm going to get eat Roundup. Well, I don't like right. that. Yeah, so just get it. Organic seems to be the way yeah, to get, that's the way plant. that you that you prevent that. And okay, so. GMOs, it's tricky. Um, all right, so uh, other questions. What if you're, this is about, we were talking about sleep before. What if you're waking up at four or five in the morning, then fall asleep again, then tired again, and can't wake up? So there's this kind of, you know, you're talking about the quality, it, the, basically it's a quantity of quality sleep. So if someone's waking up, they go back to sleep, you know, is that okay? Is that okay for your immune system? Um, you know, as long as you're getting enough overall quality of sleep throughout the day on an average basis, it's probably not affecting your immune system adversely. On the other hand, um, that kind of a sleep uh, disturbance, you know, first thing I would want to know is, well, what's waking someone up? In other words, mm -hmm. is it some feeling or emotion or is there sleep disorder or is there an issue that is waking someone up? Is it their bladder and that we could, you know, address perhaps that? Right. And if we can address the reason that somebody's waking up, they might be able to get through that stage. But what's happening with that person, the caller that asked, um, they woke up and then they had to get through another sleep cycle. And generally we go through four or five sleep cycles through the night. So we go through REM sleep into deep sleep and then back through REM and into light. And we cycle through the cycles of sleep, the phases of sleep that way. And we usually get about five cycles. So it sounds like what's happening with that caller 
they got through four cycles. They woke up for an hour, perhaps, and they went back to sleep and went into another sleep cycle. And they felt like they couldn't wake up because that was the deep sleep cycle. Um. You know, when you're in deep sleep, <clears throat> you're very groggy. Somebody has a hard time waking you up. Uh, when you're in light sleep, they say, hey, CJ, and you say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up, and you're ready to go. Right. right. Deep sleep, they got to shake you, and they've got to call and maybe, you know, touch you to get you to wake up. And that's probably what the caller was experiencing. Ah, okay. All right. Um, how, so if we keep busy, we, we won't notice we're not eating as much? That's for, true for me, but I don't know what you think about that. Um, so keep busy as a strategy for not eating as much. Yeah, there's a lot of strategies out there. Some people, some people say eat more. You know, you, know, you know, put more food in. Like what you want to do is eat a lot of beans because they don't have calories. They got all fiber, and then you can fill up on beans, and you don't have to eat all the sweets and whatnot. And, Look, all I can say is, you know, if you find a strategy that works for you, stick with it. Okay. <laughs> stick with it for a year because, look, there's a thousand diets out there. There's a hundred strategies on food. And, you know, if it's if it works to help you to eat less and you can take the weight off and keep it off for a year, you're going to be so happy because then you get the new set point. And then here's someone that I guess this is related to that question. So how do you know what's going to work for you? Is it going to be eating beans? Is it going to be eating paleo? Is it going to be, you know, because oftentimes what happens is you get on one of these kicks, you do it for a con concentrated period of time, you lose four or five pounds, maybe more. And then you like, you know, the set point sets in and then you go, oh, I'm back to 15 pounds heavier now that I've come back from Bhutan, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the rule, not the exception. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so how does one know what's going to work? I mean, you try it, but then it seems like well, more often than not, it's the seesawing back and forth. I don't know because, you know, everyone's an individual and they have a different, let's say, diet personality. Some people don't like to feel deprived. Some people are very rigid. They like to, you know, be in control and write down everything or get their meals cooked for them and delivered. Other people like to cut out a food group so that it doesn't tempt them. They just say, I don't eat dairy and ice cream and they don't have this and that. Mm -hmm. So they cut out a food group <clears throat> so they won't get tempted. But... You know, I don't know which strategy might work best for an individual, but one thing somebody might be interested in learning about is if you read my last book, The Hunter-Farmer Diet Solution, it talks about, you know, the combination between, the comparison between low-fat and low-carb diets mm -hmm. and how you can make a better choice between those two. Mm -hmm. That might be a good starting point for some of the listeners. Yeah, and we actually did a whole interview on that, on The Hunter-Farmer Diet, and it actually does make a difference because I, I was looking at my son and he's totally a hunter like he's just straight you know hips and waist no, nothing just skinny and my husband too I was looking and I thought oh actually I think he is as well because when he gains weight it's all in his belly it's nowhere else just boom concentrated in his belly so I think both of them are hunters which means like eat meat but he feels unhappy when he eats meat he's like I feel better when I eat vegetables I'm like I don't know honey you're probably well, a combo vegetables but the point is he can't have sugar you know, that's the point with the hunter, and that is they do fine with vegetables, they do fine with beans, they do fine with fruit and, be and beans and berries, but they can have sugar. Uh, and, you know, there's three sources of sugar, and that is grains, sweets, and sugar itself, and alcohol. So those are the three things that are going to make him sluggish and feel crummy. Yeah, he, he, he likes those <laughs> things. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay, so the other question was, hey, in Bible times, didn't they live hundreds of years? Well, well how so are you? they wrote. I mean, so that they wrote that there were, you know, people that had lifespans of hundreds of years but you know I don't know if that's symbolic if they had a different measurement of time if they if it was a, a fable or if it was just legend that Moses could live to be 300 or something you know I, I, I don't know there there was never proven let's say yeah <clears throat> the oldest uh, humans that have ever been found on earth are in the 120 ish you know uh, year old category I don't think anyone's made it to 140 yet or even 135. I think somebody might have made 130 once recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of the limit, it seems. I don't even know if I want to live that long. Frankly, when I was reading your book, I thought... Oh, no, we don't. We don't want to live that long. But here's the point. Look, if you're going to live to be 120, at 100, you're still a pretty, pretty good spring chicken. Yeah. In other, words, in other words, 100 is good for the person that's going to live to be 120. Yeah. The person that's going to live to be 90, 80 is horrible, you know? So... It's relative, you know, it's all relative. I'd say if you've got those genes that allow you to get to be 120, you know, 90 is pretty damn good. I mean, yeah. you're doing yoga and going out dancing, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's my last question. Because um, I, I, was, I was trying to, like, summarize your book in, like, two action items for my husband. Because <laughs> that he can follow. So one will be... Two things to do. Yeah, one will be, okay, just eat fish two to five times a week. 
that's super simple and he loves yeah. fish so that's easy yeah. okay i think the other one is take a supplement because you're saying you know basically take a multivitamin and you're no good. that wouldn't be my choice i mean i would say the number two thing and i would go with with uh, the food thing again get the beans i usually recommend that people eat try to eat a cup of beans a day yeah. and it doesn't matter if you like black beans chili beans edamame beans soybeans you know garbanzo bean split peas lentils uh, all that's fine, but try to get the cup of beans a day. And the reason is it brings 15 grams of fiber that helps the immune system. It restores the health of the gut. Mm. And that's where a lot of this autoimmune problem comes from. Mm. All right. So those are our tips. And those I've been doing tips. that. I've been eating um, some beans and it does help. We've been talking to Dr. Mark Lepanis, um, Ultra Longevity, and we have two other interviews with him. One is the Hunter Farmer Diet for his um, one of his books and also the Ultra Prevent... No, prevention, which is the other one, which you also did an interview. So there's tons and tons of other information, Mark. Thank you thank so you. much for being here. My pleasure. Thank All right. You. Thank you, listening, Austin. Thank you. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.